The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings, everyone. My name is Krista Brown, Training Specialist with the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, APS TARC, and I want to welcome you to our webinar, Promising Practices Spotlight, Focus Care Coordination and Elder Advocates, with Deidre Hunt and Aaron Salvo. I will be formally introducing our presenters in just a moment. Next slide, please. Before we get started, I'd like to share a little information. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Next slide. As many of you know, the APS TARC works with states to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Essentially, we're here to help APS programs in any way we can. Just reach out to us using the contact information that you will see at the end of the webinar. Next slide. The APS TARC presents monthly peer-to-peer -peer calls. These calls provide a forum for workers, supervisors, and managers, and administrators to dialogue and share ideas with each other about the issues and concerns facing APS programs today. The calls are held the second, third, or fourth Wednesday of each month, depending on which peer group you would like to attend. Registration information is sent via the APS listserv each month. Please email us if you are not a listserv member and would like to receive this information. Next slide. Now a little housekeeping. A handout of today's slides is available for download in the handout section of your webinar control panel, and you can download those at any time. Please use your computer speakers to access the audio for this webinar. If you do experience any audio or broadband issues during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out and log back in. It is being recorded in case for some reason you can't get back in. Next slide. We are planning to have time at the end of the panel discussion for questions and comments, and you can ask those questions at any time. Use your questions box in your webinar control panel, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. This presentation is being recorded, as I mentioned, and it'll be posted to the TARC website at a later date, along with a copy of the slides, and we will notify everyone when that is up. Everyone attending today will receive an email in approximately 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance. And last but not least, please go ahead and take that brief evaluation survey when you're prompted. We really love to have your feedback. All right, so next slide. Let's go ahead and get a sense of who we have in the audience. I'm gonna go ahead and launch a poll and give you a few minutes to uh, complete that. Which of the following categories do you identify most with? So we are collecting responses now. Is it APS, other social services professional, medical professional, legal professional, or other? And the voting has started. We'll leave that open a little bit longer. All right, just a couple more seconds and we'll go ahead and close the poll. All right, I'm going to share those results and we are resoundingly APS professionals and we have other social services professionals, some legal folks and some others. Um, if you want to go ahead and put in the questions box what other professions are joining us today, that would be awesome. Um, thank you very much for taking that poll. Let's go ahead and have next slide, please. All right, just a quick webinar overview before we um, introduce our presenters. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the focus care coordination with Deidre. Um, Elder Service Connection Program with Aaron, and then we'll have a facilitated discussion in Q&A with everyone. Next slide. 
It is my great pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Um, we have Deidre Hunt, who is Program Specialist, State Manager of Adult Protective Services with the Idaho Commission on Aging. And Aaron Salvo is Associate Director of APS in the Office of Aging and Disability Services, Main Department of Health and Human Services. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Deidre and have her take it away. Go ahead, Deidre. Thank you. Um, I want to thank APS TARC for inviting me to present today on the APS Focus Care Coordination Service that has been developed and implemented in Idaho. Like Krista shared, my name is Deidre Hunt. For the first, uh, sorry, for the past 20 years, um, I have worked for Idaho Commission on Aging as a program specialist. I'm the state manager of Idaho's Adult Protective Services, and I'm responsible for APS grants, projects, and APS contracts management. I also provide guidance and support to the APS staff statewide. <clears throat> ICOA administers Adult Protective Services, which in Idaho is a state-funded specialized social service that's directed toward assisting vulnerable adults who are age 18 and older. The commission holds contracts with six area agencies on uh, area agencies on aging in Idaho to implement APS services that cover the 44 counties of our state. As of this year, Idaho has 19 full-time APS state um, staff or APS staff statewide, and six of those staff that we have are APS supervisors. Um, today, I'm going to present information on what pointed ICOA in the direction of developing APS focus care coordination, tools that were developed and implemented, and enhancements that were made to Idaho APS management information system to support this service and the activities of Idaho APS program. Next slide, please. In keeping with the ICOA's strategic framework, the results of GAPS analysis and research conducted around evidence-based tools, interventions, standards, and training, the ICOA developed a new perspective for Idaho Adult Protective Services. That perspective has led Idaho APS to implement tools, assessments, and interventions that allow for client direction, care support, and to assist in overcoming rural challenges. This project that was funded by the ACL state grants to enhance APS um, and it's specifically and specifically um, this grant um, helped us to begin the standardization of Idaho APS processes through validating assessment tools and implementing case management intervention, as well as improving Idaho's ability to align with the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System data collection recommendations. The ICOA selected two goals for the project under this grant that aligned with the two overarching goals of the federally funded opportunity that was provided. The project goals selected were to improve experiences, health, well being, and outcomes of individuals served by the Idaho APS, to improve Idaho's ability to document and report APS case, client, and perpetrator characteristics and to services in a manner that are consistent with NAMERS. And um, for those who don't know, NAMERS is the acronym for the National Adult Maltreatment Reporting System. ICOA identified three primary objectives to meet these goals. The first objective was to select, implement, and evaluate screening assessment tools. The second objective was to pilot evaluate and implement case management and goal attainment scaling interventions. And the third objective was to create efficiencies in documentation by introducing innovative methods to capture case, client, and perpetrator information. Third slide, please. The highlight of this presentation, of course, is the Idaho Focus Care Coordination Project. And with that, I plan to share how this project encompassed all three of our state grant objectives. Idaho community stakeholders and APS staff placed case management and service coordination in the top 25% of all priority action items needed to be addressed for vulnerable adults served by Idaho APS program. In response to this need, ICOA launched a pilot project to develop and implement 
focus care coordination, and Idaho APS conducted a successful statewide demonstration of APS focus care coordination, which we call FCC. APS FCC was developed as a critical time intervention method to structure case management delivery to vulnerable adults at high risk for maltreatment and those who have already experienced maltreatment. APS FCC service is not advertised. We do not conduct outreach for FCC, but it is authorized and the authorizations are only made as a result of reports that come into area agencies on aging that allege abuse, neglect, exploitation, or self-neglect of a vulnerable adult. APS FCC develops goals that are client-centered and that support self-direction to the highest degree possible. FCC provides APS clients and their care network with hands-on assistance to identify access and to ensure follow through of services. FCC also allows APS care coordinators along with the client to develop a comprehensive safety plan that's specifically tailored to the abilities and the needs of the client and provides a focused intervention option for complex APS cases. With clients who lack support um, by allowing follow up to interventions and, um, and uh, for progress tracking. APS FCC service may be initiated at any point throughout an investigation. After an investigation has been completed or as an APS prevention service that doesn't involve an investigation at all. Like most programs, there are eligibility requirements for FCC that must be met to receive the service. When an investigation of maltreatment is initiated, Based on the discretion of the APS worker, a client may also receive FCC service as long as they are age 18 years or older. If an investigation of maltreatment is not initiated, FCC may be offered as a prevention service if an individual is age 70 or older and also meets at least one or four other criteria that, are, um, that I'll share with you. Um, those criteria are a loss of housing in the last three months, a loss of a key supports person within the last three months who provided life-sustaining activities or tasks for the individual. The individual was released from the hospital within the last two weeks and is lacking the ability to follow through on their general care, or if an individual is presenting as a danger to themselves or others. After referrals made and a client accepts service, FCC is carried out in three phases. There's a transition phase, a tryout phase, and a transfer of care phase. The three phases are conducted with the client and with the intent that the client and the support network will take on a greater and greater responsibility as the FCC service progresses through the phases. During the transition phase, Specialized support is provided to the client for approximately six weeks and a transition plan is developed and implemented. This involves making initial contacts, selecting goals, developing or reviewing a safety plan, identifying formal and informal supports, strengths and needs of the client, obtaining necessary consent and providing referrals, possibly meeting with the caregivers and existing supports and connecting family caregivers to education and supports they may need to continue in their role. During the next phase, which is the tryout phase, the APS care coordinator facilitates and monitors the client's problem solving skills, observes the operation of the support network, tracks progress towards the goals and modifies the networking list and task list as it's necessary. During the third phase, uh, which is the transfer of care phase, the APS care coordinator concludes the FCC service with a support network in place, making sure that the supports can function independently, reviewing the safety plan with the client, holding a meeting with the client and supports to mark the final transfer of care, and then a final check to make sure that that client has all the tools needed to manage the long-term care goals that have been set. 
A 90-day guideline has been established for Idaho FCC for the completion of the three phases. But if the phases move along more quickly, that's fine. And many times they do. Um, it just depends on the capability of the client and, um, and the supports that are available. During the three phases, the care coordinator reduces activity involvement while continuing to monitor until the service is fully closed. Through this process, if the APS care coordinator finds that the client is unable to participate at any point as necessary for this service, or if the third phase can't be completed by the end of three months, the case is reviewed with a supervisor and possibly referred for long-term care management or case management. Next slide, please. The ICOA worked with RTZ, who is the system developer for Idaho Get Care APS, to complete modifications and enhancements to substantially support consistency with namers. Through these efforts, ICOA increased Idaho's NAMERS reporting capability from 40% up to 85%. By choice, ICOA excluded 15% of the NAMERS data collection recommendations from our information system because they don't align with how Idaho APS is structured and we didn't intend to collect that information. To give you an example of what we left out, we didn't include the FIPS codes associated to clients' residents or FIPS codes associated to investigation agencies. And we chose to include only the six federally recognized races rather than all of the races options that were available and listed in NAMERS. ICOA now um, is able to report to NAMERS at a case component level, which is the highest level of reporting available. The statistics that are on the PowerPoint slide are FCC facts pulled from our enhanced management information system. Statistics like these and more are not only interesting, but will help us to know that we are um, correctly focusing our APS services and our funding. For example, the age requirement for FCC service is age 70 or older. You can see from the data collected that the uh, that since the implementation of FCC, the average age of clients uh, receiving the service are age 77. Um, this type of information indicates to me that we have the age for the eligibility set correctly. If the average age was coming up to be 70 or 71, um, this may be an indicator to me that uh, the average age is, uh, I'm sorry, that um, maybe we need to take a look at our age criteria for this service and possibly reset it. Also, um, you can see from a quick glance here uh, that we um, see FCC is on average delivered to an individual who is 77 years old, homebound, self-neglecting, and living with a disability. And also you can see that gender doesn't seem to really be a heavy factor for those who need this service, as the data shows that the client served came out to be exactly 50% male and 50% female. This information, I think, will help us learn where we may need to build stronger resources to meet the specific needs of the people with certain demographic profiles. Finally, I would like to share with you four innovative methods that were created as efficiencies to better document APS case files and support the work of APS FCC. ICOA contracted with RTZ to create an APS offline tool within Idaho Get Care APS Management Information System to provide APS staff with the ability to check out an individual APS case record on a mobile IT device, review and update case information, and conduct assessments while they're out in the field without any need for an active internet connection. When the APS worker gets back to the location where an internet connection can be reestablished, the offline tool can then be synchronized with the GetCare APS online system and allow the new data to transfer to an online APS case record. This is especially helpful in Idaho, since 35 of Idaho's 44 counties are rural and have poor or very little internet connectivity. ICOA purchased 
Apple iPads for use by the APS staff in the field and to work in conjunction with the Get Care APS, uh, APS offline tool. ICOA selected Apple iPads as the user platform for the offline tool based on the high security, the quality of the hardware, and controlled user environment. Uh, we also purchased protective covers for these iPads that have a built-in keyboard so APS workers can pull away from a home um, uh, from when, when they're at a home visit. They can get in their car, pull away, stop somewhere safe and quickly type in notes to a case file where everything is fresh in their mind and before going on to the next home visit. The idea behind this was to promote more complete data collection and to reduce the need for the APS worker to take notes on paper that later have to be input into a client file later in the day. Goal attainment scaling was developed as a structured way for APS staff to work with clients by setting and tracking personal goals and having formulated sections, selections, that are based on common need of APS clients. ICOA contracted with RTZ to embed the goals for the goal attainment scaling into the Get Care APS management information system. This allows for greater efficiency in that APS staff can access the goal attainment scaling while using that offline tool that I just shared with you and while working with the clients in their home. It also minimizes the need to write out common goals over and over again because most of them are already been um, pre-developed. ICOA contracted with Dr. David Burns to work with Idaho APS staff statewide and provided supervision in the creation of Idaho specific predetermined <clears throat> list of 15 goals that was created, including one blank goal option available for those situations where the predetermined goals list doesn't really meet the client's need. And then finally, um, we also um, implemented a clutter image rating tool, um, which we call the CIR. It's a standardized assessment that helps to reduce the subjectivity of personal and environmental cleanliness when describing environment, uh, the environment of someone's home. The APS worker now documents clutter based on a scale of one to nine with corresponding pictures that illustrate the level of clutter in the home and in certain rooms of the home. This tool can also be used to open conversations with clients, allowing them to identify the clutter in their home um, at the time of the assessment and to identify how they envision themselves and their home environment um, and how it should look to improve their health and safety. ICOA contracted with RTZ to embed the CIR assessment tool into the APS management information system and to make it accessible using the offline tool. The CIR assessment can be documented quickly and it can be performed at the first home visit and again during follow-up visits to mark improvement or decline of an environment over a period of time. And that tool, um, when documented properly, can also um, be useful if, take, if it's taken to court, if a case record is taken to court, because it's standardized and has pictures that are associated with the level of clutter or non-clutter in a home. It can give a judge and other people involved in the court case a clear picture of what the home looked like and the level that it might have progressed quickly or slowly over time and how things are looking and maybe the needs of the client. In closing, I'm happy to, oh, I'm sorry, um, slide please. I'm happy to share with you that FCC service and the four methods that were created as efficiencies to better document APS case files and to support the work of APS FCC are sustainable. And I didn't, and none of them ended with the grant. Um, um, end date. The delivery of FCC service continues to be offered to Idaho APS clients through the investigation and prevention arms of Idaho Adult Protective Services. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you.
Thank you, Deidre. My gosh, what a great, what a great program. Thank you so much. Um, just one super quick question to address. Um, what is the name of the program software you're using? We had a question from Michelle. Um, it is called GetCare. Um, it's um, RTZ is the developer and GetCare not only is for our APS, it also um, ha we have GetCare Ombudsman, all of our um, Title III pro uh, programs are in it and Adult Protective Services. And then there's firewalls, of course, between things that need to um, have a firewall, but we can pull information that is not necessarily um, uh, confidential from one program to the other. Great, thank you. All mm -hmm. right, so we're gonna go ahead and hand it on over to Erin. Take it away. Thank you, Krista, and um, thank you for inviting me to speak about this uh, program today. Um, as, as you said, my name is Erin Salvo. I'm the Associate Director of Maine's Adult Protective Services Program. And I'll just start by providing some quick background information on Maine's APS structure. Our program is a state administered program. We sit within the Office of Aging and Disability Services in the Department of Health and Human Services. We have a fairly broad statutory mandate. We're responsible for investigating allegations of abuse, neglect, including self-neglect and exploitation, as well as the substantial risk of abuse, neglect or exploitation for any incapacitated or dependent adult. About 65% of our clients are age 60 or older. And I mentioned that because the project we're focusing on today is one that is targeted exclusively towards our clients who are 60 and older. Our team is primarily based in our eight district offices across the state covering all 16 counties of Maine. You can see this on the map on the slide. We have one central intake unit that receives reports through our 24 hour phone intake line. And this team also receives reports through our online reporting form through the DHHS website. So currently we're screening in approximately 800 calls per month. So we're continuing to see that number trend upward. Most recently, we've broken the record for the total number of monthly screened in reports for our program with more than a thousand reports in January and again in March. I'll also mention that Maine APS encompasses our state's public guardianship program. We have a separate team of staff dedicated to serving these clients and we're, curr we're currently um, public guardian or, and or conservator for approximately 1,300 adults statewide. Next slide, please. So in 2018, we applied for and were awarded a three-year APS enhancement grant to carry out a project in partnership with an organization called the Elder Abuse Institute of Maine and a team of experts on the topic of abuse of older adults and related research, including M.T. Connolly, Dr. David Burns of University of Toronto, Dr. Stuart Lewis of Dartmouth, and Dr. Zach Gassimus of University of Southern California. The goal of the project was to develop an evidence base on a service planning phase of the APS process. In other words, we wanted to develop a model for supporting APS clients and strengthening their support systems and ultimately their quality of life beyond the limited time frame when APS is actively involved in a case. We structured the project in three distinct parts. The first eight months of the project were dedicated to planning. This planning stage was really critical because it gave the team a chance to think through the big picture aspects of the project and get into some of the nitty gritty. What kinds of procedure documents do we need for staff? How do we build support among APS staff for the project? How can we ensure we're capturing data needed to answer our research questions? So lots of conversations that really helped us get to a place where we had a solid foundation to initiate the actual work. What we developed in the planning stage was the Elder Services Connections Program to pilot in two randomly selected counties, Cumberland and Aroostook, which happened to be Maine's most urban county and our most rural county. The Elder Abuse Institute hired a small team of elder advocates who were based in these two counties. And the concept that during an APS investigation, APS would make a referral with the client's consent to an elder advocate, and then the advocate could build a relationship with this client to focus on the immediate specific needs of that person ranging from addressing issues with housing, transportation, legal needs, financial management, et cetera. And then they could also help to advocate for and coordinate these services. Advocates were trained in four specific modalities to support their work with clients prior to the launch of the program. 
Those modalities are motivational interviewing, supported decision-making, teaming, and restorative approaches. The Elder Services Connections Program officially launched in July 2019. This is where we started the implementation phase of the research project when APS began referring clients to elder advocates. Now, an unforeseen challenge did set us back a little during this phase. That is COVID. So we had to make some adjustments along the way and made the decision to extend the implementation phase to try to gather as much data on the program as possible. So the analysis phase of the original 2018 grant is currently underway. The research team has the data from the implementation phase and will be learning more later this summer as they sort through that information. In the meantime, we had so much anecdotal information supporting the program, primarily some positive feedback from APS staff who had made referrals and seen the benefits to clients directly, that we wanted to keep this model active. So the COVID relief funds and American Rescue Plan funds gave us this opportunity to expand the pilot program to all of our counties and we expect to be able to fund this work through at least early 2024 using grant funds. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight what I view as some of the key features of this program so far. First, it's a warm handoff, meaning our APS staff take the time to introduce the program to a client in a conversation, not providing a brochure or just a phone number and leaving it at that. Uh, depending on the client's preference, the APS caseworker may even join that initial meeting with the advocate to help build rapport. Uh, next, the elder advocates have flexibility in their approach. They aren't subject to some of the strict time frames that APS is to close out a case or a particular number of in-person visits or something like that. They really partner with the client to meet their needs. In addition to what I've mentioned earlier, they've helped clients get access to public benefits, helped reestablish relationships relationships with family members and helped uh, clients deal with navigating the long-term care placement process. So I as I mentioned on the last slide, advocates are working under a model that includes four modalities, and I think that also speaks to their flexibility. So they're very focused on supporting and empowering the client in the client's decision-making and building that support network for the person. So this relationship building can take some time, so having that flexibility is really key. Another feature is that this is a program that, exclus that is exclusively available to clients who have APS involvement. I think offering a service to clients who have experienced abuse, neglect, or exploitation, or are struggling to meet their own needs for whatever reason is really valuable. And before this program launched, there wasn't anything like that in Maine. And then finally, I think the most important feature is that there, there, there is a strong partnership and communication between APS and the Elder Services Connections team. APS caseworkers have confidence that when they make that referral for a client, the client's gonna hear from an advocate and get strong support from that advocate. APS caseworkers are also invested in the success of their clients. So we realize that having advocates share good news back to APS, even if the case was closed on the APS side, was a really great way to strengthen the program. To support that, we set up regular group check-in meetings between APS caseworkers and advocates where a caseworker and an advocate would jointly present information on a recent case for discussion. This would give a chance for folks to hear about the ways advocates were supporting uh, clients and uh, building the relationship between our teams. I also listed communication here because of course, like with any program, there are questions that come up along the way about how to administer the program overall. So I stay in close contact with the Elder Services Connections team um, we have a feedback loop within our APS program as well. And if we need to make any tweaks in our process or forms or anything like that, we can address those things as proactively as possible. Next slide, please. I've listed here a few stats about the program to date. Like I mentioned earlier, we are expecting to have quite a bit more data available from the initial pilot um, in our original two counties later this summer. And we plan to build off of that to inform the work moving forward even more. So um, more to come on that. And uh, next slide, please. That's, uh, that's my, my broad overview of the Elder Services Connections program. I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Erin. All right, so let's go into a uh, next slide and please feel free to go ahead and send in your questions. We're going to have a little chat with our presenters right now and then we'll we'll definitely get to your questions as well. So 
Excellent. Awesome. Awesome information for both of you. And I think you addressed my first question or um, the next steps for each of your projects. Is there anything else you wanted to add? So Deidre, you said that it is sustainable and nothing has ended and with the grant and you're moving forward, correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, great. Um, and Erin, it sounds like you have expanded the pilot to the entire state and um, we'll have more data um, thereafter. Is there anything else on next steps for your project? So um, there is certainly a, a, a need for funding to maintain the, the program. And, and as I mentioned, we have uh, funding grant funds through um, some point in 2024. So we're exploring what options may be available to continue the, the program longer term and with the combination of the aggregate data as well as anecdotal information, we're hoping to build that case. Great, thank you. Um, so Deidre, any lessons learned, challenges, or surprises, and those can be happy surprises as well. <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, yeah, um, challenges wise, um, we, I mentioned to you um, at the time that we were doing this project, we only had 15 APO staff um, and some of those, and we had six APS supervisors of those 15 staff. So not all of them could carry a full caseload. And uh, we, uh, we did this pilot project with the same number of staff adding no staff and um, and it made it difficult um, to add more service being provided by APS that was already on limited staff um, it, it, it was definitely a challenge trying to get an opportunity to offer a new service um, to um, to clients and so getting we had to work it in because you're required to do investigations of abuse, neglect, and exploitation. And this is more of a prevention and case management type service. So it was limited how many, how much we could provide to people. Um, and um, so what we did initially, and this was a lesson learned, was we narrowed the, um, the eligibility so tight um, that we actually had no client we only had two clients at first for um, for quite some time and um, because we were afraid to get it to the criteria too loose for fear that we would be overwhelmed um, and not have enough staff to handle the situation so we actually started out with the criteria being 75 and older we only had two um, two people who qualified cognitively able to um, participate in the program because they they need to be able to work with the um, care coordinator and establish a plan and then also keep it going afterward um, so we bumped it out to 70 and it seemed to be perfect because um, uh, now we have identified more people we have, our primary um, group is 77 but we have people on that younger side um, and and fewer people on the older side. It seems um, the older they get, uh, they get, the more cognitive issues they seem to have and are less likely to be able to participate in this uh, project. So those were lessons learned and challenges that we dealt with. Also, uh, of course, COVID was a serious challenge because to do this type of service, you need to be able to build a rapport with the clients. And face-to-face -face is the best way to do that. Without having their trust, how are we supposed to build a safety plan? So, um, you know, it, it took a, a quite a bit um, to get things established, but you know, with lots of PPE, um, learning how to speak at more of a distance and still be, um, you know, confidential in your work, and also being able to make phone calls where normally we would do in person, um, helped us be able to address um, the issues that um, COVID brought on. Great, thank you. And Erin, um, thus far in your process. Lessons learned, challenges, surprises? I think one challenge that I didn't um, address in my di directly in my initial presentation related more to how we built in the, the research components of the project. So um, 
initially we developed a client survey that we presented clients with at the beginning of uh, APS involvement. And then six weeks after um, the in involvement ended, and the goal there was to kind of um, provide uh, some additional data points um, around you know, client-based information around their perceptions of APS intervention and their work with elder advocates. Um, and surveys are a, a very challenging process, especially when you add in um, the, the challenges of being uh, unable to meet with people um, face to face as often with COVID. Uh, so I think that um, taking the time to really build the programmatic structure alongside the, the research, um, the, the data collection is was a challenge in, in some ways um, for us. Um, and I think in terms of surprises, a um, you know a positive surprise, initially we were thinking, um, a, a benefit of the elder advocate program would be that um, the, the the workload case volume that APS in Maine is experiencing would be um, supported by being able to pass off through the warm handoff to advocates. And initially, we thought, well, once a case is closed and it's handed off to an advocate, the you know, APS staff will have moved on to their next cases. And um, you know, we learned very quickly that people were wondering, well, well, what ended up happening? How did everything work out? And that's when we ended up developing um, the check-in process to really highlight those successes and and um, you know recognize that people remain invested in in their client success even after the case is formally closed. Um, and I think that that was a, a positive um, realization and and shift that we made during the project. Oh, that's cool. That That is very, very cool. Thank you. Um, so Deidre, any words of wisdom for folks who may want to replicate something similar in their APS program, their jurisdiction? Yeah, um, so the, the service is a great one. And um, one thing though that we, um, we really didn't anticipate is that many of the people that are referred to us that seem as though they would be able to um, work well in this um, service, um, being able to um, work with the care coordinator to make a plan, all those things start happening. But when the care coordinator starts backing off and it's expected that the client and the service and the service or the people who are helping with the services take on that greater and greater role, we didn't anticipate that um, there would be so many people that couldn't take on that that role uh, when it came time. And so um, my uh, suggestion as words of wisdom, it would be to make sure that you have a plan in place to be able to direct those people who've gone through the process and set up a, a kind of a, a protective plan and the services that they need, that you would have a service available that you could um, uh, refer them to, such as a, a long-term case management type situation. Uh, we do not have that in place right now, so um, it is a struggle in some situations where we don't have um, the proper service to refer somebody to if they can't take on this role um, as their own um, as the, their own person to be able to manage this service. But um, that is one of our next steps. We are actively piloting a project to establish a case management resource in Idaho that would be available for APS clients needing case management services beyond the 90 days of FCC. So I recommend having something like that in place ahead of time. Great, thank you. That's really good wor words of wisdom. Um, Aaron, any any words of wisdom? I think what I would say is um, one thing I was really grateful for uh, when we began the initial pilot back in 2018 was that we um, built in that development and planning phase and had the eight months to really think through all the aspects of rolling out the project for the implement the the next step that implementation phase. I think um, you know so often when launching a project, we're crunch for time. We want to make um, want to roll something out as rapidly as possible to maximize the benefit to clients. Um, but if there isn't a successful launch and it's 
too discombobulated initially or there are, are too many bumps to iron out, um, it might not be successful and people won't stay invested and, and take advantage of the program. So um, I would say particularly if um, pursuing a time limited project, there, there is definitely value in, um, in giving yourself that time to really think it through and um, kind of get all your ducks in a row um, before, before officially launching. Great, great advice. You need to have a strong foundation, right? <laughs> so, um, okay, so we do have actually quite a few questions. So I'm going to go ahead and, and jump on over to participant questions. Um, so uh, Deidre, Idaho, um, could you share a bit more about the goal attainment scaling work? So what process did you use to develop the 15 statements? And off the, off the cuff, could you provide an example of one of those statements? Um, it, well, let's see. So we um, had a stakeholder group, which um, included all of our um, APS staff. Um, we brought a good deal of them to one central location in Boise, Idaho, um, so that we could um, sit around tables and talk with each other. Uh, those people who couldn't attend, they uh, attended on a, um, I think it was Zoom. And we then we had some other stakeholders as well, emergency responders and um, uh, some people from aging, um, uh, it's a specialized aging program at Boise State University. We all came together and identified what we believed were the, um, the most common things um, that um, people would need for, for goals. And um, it, it was interesting. We, so we came up with 15 of them and um, everybody agreed on them. Um, and the most, uh, so I'll share with you, the most often identified goals to date were limited to seven um, when we did a, a check over all the cases. And they're like, uh, one of them is accessing assisted devices, um, accessing caregiver resources, accessing external resources, accessing alternative housing, connecting and attending medical care, um, and establishing substitute decision a decision maker and attending supportive activities. Those are the top seven goals um, that people um, uh, have in their plans um, who have already gone through the FCC program. And um, Dr. David Burns actually is the one who um, created the goal attainment scaling in the first place. And we contracted with him to come here to Idaho because he's an expert at this, obviously. And he helped us work through an entire process of getting to the point that we had the top 15 um, uh, identified goals that could be put into our system and um, help us minimize um, just having to redo these goals over and over again, and also to put a scoring mechanism to these goals in the likelihood of them being met. And we were able to use those, um, mostly the scoring, um, to help us in developing uh, or help us in gathering information for reporting of our grant project. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, so a couple questions for, oh, actually, um, Deidre, before um, you mute yourself, um, can you, can you, uh, uh, the, cl uh, the clutter uh, assessment that's embedded, um, yes. CIR, what does that stand for again? Clutter image rating. Great, thank you so much. All right, so a couple questions for, for Aaron. Um, so what were the data improvement pieces that you worked on? The data improvement pieces um, in terms of the, the Yeah, grant. let me. Maybe a little yeah. more detail would be helpful. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, Catherine, if you want to, um, if you want to type in a little bit more clarification for that one, there is another question though. Um, who supervises the elder advocates in Maine? They have a um, 
a hired supervisor within the Elder Abuse Institute, so the part of the, that nonprofit organization. All right. And do those supervisors work closely with you and your administrative staff? They do. It's um, you know one benefit of Maine being a smaller state is that um, I work directly with the the director of the Elder Abuse Institute, and there's one supervisor um, who's supervising the those elder advocates. So it, it's um, you know kind of a small but mighty team in that way. Great, thank you. Um, and so. Deidre and I think Erin um, talked about supported decision making. Um, are there any best practices or um, words of wisdom that you can you can share um, from using SDM in in these situations? Um, and Jennifer, um, I will send you some other resources too. There are some supported decision making. Um, uh, resources out there. So, uh, this is Deidre. I don't feel that I have anything that would be um, out of the ordinary for supportive decision making. Making um, our APS staff um, follow fairly general guidelines for supportive decision making. Making and one of them is to uh, first listen to what it is that the client has. Um, um, what they need and then to always focus on um, doing the service and getting a service that they're um, that the client is saying that they want rather than what we're telling them that we want to give them great thank you so you're just using the general philosophy and, and yes best practices okay Erin, yes. did you have anything to add i would just echo what what you Deidre said, I think um, a lot of the material that's available formally about supported decision making is uh, more is focused on the um, population of adults with intellectual disability, developmental disability, and uh, it sometimes that uh, structure looks a little bit different when we're talking about someone with waning capacity uh, who's an older adult, and that is something that we kind of would. Uh, tried to keep in mind and just make supported decision making be something that could be kind of an organic conversation or organic component of a conversation with the client really kind of um, keeping the, the client's uh, preferences beliefs um, desires central to, to the decision making Great, thank you. That that really gets to the nature of this question too, because the the end of it is where the individual has limited natural supports. So um, so you are using supported decision making, but but really meeting them where they are, in every sense of the the word. Um, right, it's not, and it's not a formulaic kind of thing. Um, Right, and I was just going to add, you know, when when you talk about four four modalities that our advocates are using, they really kind of overlap in many ways. So, uh, restorative approaches and teaming also can include if if someone a client has a fractured relationship with a family member, for instance, and it's something that they would like to repair, helping facilitate those conversations um, can then help over time have a more supportive network for the person and 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 kind of give everyone involved the tools to be um, be present for the person in their own decision making. Great, thank you. And this is a question for both of you. Um, how has the community or other professionals responded to this program? So feedback from how folks feel about it um, and even, even the clients, if you have any feedback. Uh, we haven't received, this is Deidre, we haven't, we don't um, get a lot of feedback from the community um, because as I said, we don't, uh, we don't advertise this service um, and we don't do outreach. So really it's the clients and their family members who know more about this service than anything. And I should clarify the reason why we don't advertise it or do outreach is because we don't have enough staff to take on um, 
ha um, a bunch of referrals. So we always base it on the referrals that we naturally get through Adult Protective Services. Um, but for those people who are completing the service and, um, and having things put in place, it's making a difference for them. Um, while, while in some certain circumstances, the, for people who have maybe a little bit of, of loss of their um, memory or um, they have learned that that might be happening here in the near future because of a diagnosis, this type of service can allow them to set up a plan ahead of time. And for those people who are already in the midst of having some difficulties, um, it allows them to have services put in place that, that will be able to keep them where they wanna be for a longer period of time. Where if the services were not um, set up and a plan wasn't put in place, um, they likely would not be able to stay in their res where they're residing in their own home and um, in a safe and happy, healthy um, location. Great, thank you. And Erin? We also haven't had um, too much feedback from the community, partly because we are also not advertising it more broadly, since this is a, a program that is that requires APS involvement as a as a criterion to to access the service. Um, but you know, anecdotally, we've heard from from many clients that they are have have um, are, are very grateful for having engaged with an advocate. Um, and in, in some instances, people who may have initially been hesitant about working with APS more directly um, because we are the government and sometimes people have uh, you know, a level of fear uh, associated with you know, any kind of government entity once they're working with that advocate who they don't see as someone who has that same authority, um, they're able to open up a little bit more and we can get to the root of some of the concerns they're experiencing. Um, so we've seen that in a number of cases um, that that's benefited clients. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, well, I think we got to almost all the questions and I will go ahead and close and give you a few minutes more of your, your time back of your day. So next slide. I just wanna thank um, Deidre and Aaron so much for taking the time to talk with us today. That, that was excellent. And I'm super excited about your programs and I. I, I want to hear more and more, um, Deidre, about your longer term case management and Aaron about the next phases of, of um, your project. It's, it's awesome. Um, I want to also thank Andrew Capehart of our, our TARC team for Renin Slides. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we hope to see you for the next APS TARC webinar for the greater APS field on May 5th. And that will be on equity and cultural humility in APS beginning the conversation around staff and client experiences. Uh, registration is still open for that. So please email us if you'd like to attend and we'll get that registration to you. Um, please enjoy the rest of your day and we will see you next time. Thank you so much.